There we go. Thanks, Nikki. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arts and Science Exchange Orientation with the International Programs Office. My name is Haley McCormick. My pronouns are she, her. I am the Arts and Science Exchange Coordinator, and we're joined tonight by Nikki Gale, who is the International Programs Assistant in the IPO, whose pronouns are also she, her. At tonight's session, we're going to spend about an hour talking about your upcoming Winter 2022 Exchange. We're going to cover a lot of ground, but we want to remind you that this session is recorded. So you'll receive a recording of the session with, with closed captions, and you'll be able to review this moving forward. To begin our time together, I would like to acknowledge that Queen's University and Kingston are both situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee nations. To reflect on this is to reflect on the longer history of this place, one that predates the arrival of the earliest European settlers. It's also to reflect on the special relationship that has existed and continues to exist between Indigenous caretakers and the land. Today in Canada is election day. It's a really exciting day. Hopefully if you're uh, able to vote, you were able to today or in advance. Um, and I know that uh, one of the, the really important topics being covered in a lot of election coverage, and that's been covered at Queen's quite regularly for, for many years is the uh, relationship between settlers and um, indigenous nations here on Turtle Island. I would encourage you all to consider your own knowledge of the history of this land and the role and responsibilities that you take on um, in, in regards to the land in regards to your positionality here on Turtle Island. And I particularly would encourage you to consider that in the light of your upcoming exchange. Exchange is an incredible opportunity, and it does mean that you are going to be stepping foot onto the lands of other people. So I would encourage you to think about the histories of those places as well whether there are Indigenous nations and peoples on those places, and to think about the knowledge and the stories that you can bring from your own experiences here on Turtle Island to continue to expand on that conversation. So please do include that as a really important part of your pre-departure preparations and keep that as a constant thought during your exchange. In terms of our session for today, we're going to be speaking about other ways that you can prepare for exchange. We're going to cover a few topics. Our primary focus is academics. We're going to start though with an overview of COVID-19 and exchange. Then we'll provide a quick overview of your exchange specifically. And then, like I said, we'll spend the majority of our time together talking pardon me, talking about academic planning for exchange. So we'll cover transferring credits, the transfer credit tools that you're going to use to adequately plan for your upcoming studies abroad. And we're going to spend some time talking a bit about academic differences as well. So what you might experience as you move into a new university setting. And of course, we're going to answer some of the questions that you asked in the registration. And we're also going to answer some of the questions that come up for you during the session. In terms of next steps, we had the safety abroad session. Uh, that covers your off-campus activity safety policy scheduled for September 13th. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, we did need to move that session. It has been rescheduled for October 6th from 7 to 8 p.m. It will be a Zoom meeting, and we're going to be sending you a formal invitation to join us for that session tomorrow. And of course, we have our famous Exchange Connect happening this Thursday on September 23rd. So we are hard at work uh, preparing for that. That's going to be a really great way for you to get a student perspective of the overall exchange journey through a short presentation and then connect with other students virtually who either are going to your host country from the Arts and Science Exchange Program from Queens or who are here at Queens currently on an exchange from your host country. So it's all about peer-to-peer -peer connection and helping you get that student's perspective on your upcoming program. For today, we're gonna to be helping you develop a broad understanding of your journey on the exchange program, learn about successful transitions, both personal and academic, and understand your pre-departure responsibilities. We know you're going to have questions as we move through the presentation, so we will ask you to either type your questions in the chat, and Nikki will track those for us, thank you Nikki, or use your microphone and verbally ask your questions at the end of the orientation. Do remember that this orientation is being recorded. Um, of course, if you've got more specific questions, for instance, about your degree plan, um, you know, particular courses that are available at your host university or maybe academic accommodations, 
do make sure to book a separate session to talk with myself. We can get into more detail about the particularities um, and that's the better space to, to have those conversations. We're happy to answer general questions here tonight though. I want to start off first by saying congratulations to all of you, uh, particularly the students who are here who've had maybe some cancellations or some disruptions to your exchange. It's been a really trying couple of years for all of us in many regards with the pandemic, um, and particularly when it comes to international travel and international studies. You've all persevered throughout, throughout online studies and Zoom rooms and virtual exams. You should be really proud of uh, your resilience and your grit. Um, and we just want to say from the IPO team to you all a big congratulations on making it through and on your participation on this program. We hope exchange is an amazing experience for you all. Now let's talk about COVID-19 and potentially how it might impact your exchange. Before I proceed, I do want to remind you that we had an, uh, an town hall focused on COVID-19 that was held towards the end of August. So we do have the recording of that session on our YouTube page. We had sent it out to you. Um, make sure to refer back to that along with the information sheet we built about COVID-19 in exchange if you have any questions about how this could impact your exchange. So COVID-19 in exchange, uh, they have a, a, a difficult relationship as we've noted over the last 18 months or so. Thankfully, things are looking up. And while we remain hopeful that exchanges will proceed in the winter 2022 term, there does remain the possibility that student mobility, including your exchange, could be suspended due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I mentioned, continue to adhere to the resources we've provided. Um, we do have about 20 or 25 students out on the program right now, which is really exciting. It was a long year without mobility. Um, so as I mentioned, things are looking up, but we want you to keep this consideration in your mind, keep this uh, as a potential in your planning as well. And as we mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out if you're feeling a bit uneasy or uncertain about proceeding, knowing that the pandemic is, of course, continuing to happen. We're happy to listen to those concerns. We're happy to have conversations with you, share what we know. Um, it's definitely something we would encourage you to reach out about. Don't hold on to those fears on your own if, if you have any. Um, and do keep an eye on our, our IPO socials as well. If you're on Instagram and you're following us, I think we're Queen's U IPO, you'll actually see some takeovers this fall from students that we currently have abroad. Um, so remember to be hopeful as well as we continue on in this fall term. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your exchange. I like to provide a slide in these orientation sessions where we talk about some of the key kind of qualities or, or considerations for exchange students. Um, I find that this is helpful in a way to lay a bit of a base or foundation for this more in-depth conversation we're about to have on transfer credits. So what I want to do is walk through a couple of facts about being an exchange student. Hopefully this will both answer some questions and, as I mentioned, give you a bit of grounding for the transfer credit conversation. So. As an exchange student, you will be enrolling as a visiting student for one semester at another university. While you are a visiting student at this other university, you are subject to their academic regulations and of course, to the laws of your host country. And you're gonna hear some more interesting facts about that at the safety abroad session on October 6th. Of course, you're still a Queen student at this time. So you'll be bound as well by the student code of content here at Queen's while you're participating on the exchange program. In terms of academics, you're going to enroll in a full-time course load at your host university. And we're going to get into some details about what that specifically means. While you're on exchange, your tuition will be continued to be paid to Queen's University. And your tuition will cover a full course load. So that's 15 units. Tuition on the exchange program is not prorated, so your tuition for exchange will always cover 15 units. While on exchange, you will be responsible for completing your host university courses and in those courses, earning the Queen's equivalent of a C in order to transfer your credit. We're going to tell you specifically what that means in the context of your host university quite soon. So, what does this mean in terms of transferring your credit and your academic planning? I know many of you have questions about this, so we're going to start by providing an overview. After we provide an overview of the transfer credit process, your academic planning, and then we'll talk a little bit about the tools that the IPO has developed to help you move as seamlessly as possible through that process. 
and your next steps, of course. So let's take a step back and let's think about transferring credit. Um, I feel like I've already been talking too much. So I wanna ask for folks to indicate in the chat if they have ever transferred credit to Queen's University before. Maybe high school credits, maybe you did a summer program. Let's see if folks have experience with this. Oh, so I'm seeing some yeses, some no. Nose, nose, nose. Okay. Wow, quite a few of you have. That's excellent. Okay, wonderful news. So in terms of exchange, we have a very unique and specific transfer credit process. So for those of you who said yes, that's wonderful. And I think it gives you some experience that will be useful here. But I think it's equally important whether you have or you haven't to pay close attention to the particular steps that we want you to walk through. But as I mentioned, we're gonna start with an overview. So when it comes to transferring credit, our concern is the num not the number of courses that you enroll in at your host universities. Our concern is the number of credits that you achieve at your host university. The IPO will look at the total number of credits on your host university transcript when you're all done exchange to determine if you have completed a full course load. You're going to know what constitute a full course load well ahead of departure because we're going to give you the, that information in a document called Academic Parameters of Exchange and that's going to reach you in probably the next two to three weeks. So as I mentioned, completing a full course load on exchange means that you will be eligible to receive the equivalent of a full course load in transfer credit from Queens. But what does that mean? That is a lot of jargon. Let's break it down with a few examples. And we're going to use Sciences Po as an example. Anyone here going to Sciences Po? No pressure, but if you want, you're very welcome to say yes or, or uh, in the chat. Um, so Sciences Po is a uh, university in France and they have the uh, European credit transfer system. That's what they use to count credits. In Sciences Po, we're gonna use the single term example here. An arts and science exchange student would need to enroll in 30 ECTS, 30 European credit transfer system units, in order to have a course load that's equal to 15 units at Queens, which is the full course load that you normally enroll in in a single term here at Queens. So when a student going to Sciences Po for the winter 2022 term gets their academic parameters of exchange document, it will tell them that they need to enroll in 30 ECTS. As I mentioned, there is no indication here that we are telling you how many courses you need to enroll in. The reason for that is because courses can be weighted differently. One course could be worth three ECTS, another course could be weighted at six ECTS. So it's not possible for us to give you a number of courses that you should enroll in. Instead, we have to give you that credit, total number of credits. So for sales ball, 30 ECTS equals 15 units at Queens. And when you get your academic parameters of exchange document, it will give you that magical number of credits you need to enroll in. So we will do that work for you. The work that you'll need to do is when you're registering with your host university, and you're signing up for courses, make sure that you're tracking the number of units or credits or points, whatever they may call them there, and you are adding up to that magic number we're giving you on your academic parameters of exchange document. So that is the, the key kind of golden rule when it comes to transferring credits, making sure that you are counting and you are getting to that full course load we've told you, that, that special magic number for credits. Another common question we get about transfer credits is how is the course going to transfer back to Queens? And credit can really only transfer in one of two ways. It can transfer as specified credit or unspecified credit. We're gonna stick with our sales Po example here. So let's start with just specified credit. Specified credit means that the content of a course taken elsewhere is similar to a Queens course. So for example, in the past, a student went to Sciences Po in exchange and they took a course called Contemporary Strategic Issues and World Politics. When they were working with their transfer credit advisor to prepare for exchange, they had that course syllabus looked at and the professor in the Department of Political Studies read through the syllabus and said, hmm, this looks similar to a course we offer here, Development Theory, Paul's 346. And they signed off on that. That means that they thought this was a specified credit. And when we transferred that credit back to Queens, 
we indicated on the student's transcript that it transferred as Paul's, indicating it's a political studies course, 346, indicating it's a 300 level or upper year course. And we gave it the specific code uh, for development theory. So that indicates to anyone who's assessing the transcript that the course was similar. Unspecified credit is perhaps more common. I haven't done the uh, statistical overview to determine that fully, but I would say it's very, very common. Uh, an unspecified transfer credit means that the course being transferred or the credit from the course being transferred does not have a direct equivalent here at Queens. And I always say to students, this is one of the reasons to study abroad, to take courses that aren't part of the Queens curriculum, to expand your knowledge, to explore different subjects. So this is not a bad thing. So we would consult with the department uh, always uh, for transfer credit and the department, usually the transfer credit advisor, would determine if the course is a legit offering the field, in the field. So perhaps we don't have the course equivalent at Queens, they still will look at it and say, is this legitimate? What level would it be at? Can it transfer? So we have another example here from Sciences Po. In the past, a student took a course called Narratives of Justice. Um, and this course transferred back as Paul's 300 unspecified. That's what the UNS on the screen stands for. So the transfer credit advisor at the time would have looked at the course and thought, nope, we don't have anything like this in the Department of Political Studies here at Queens, but it's definitely a legitimate offering the field. It certainly fits in the subject area of political studies. It's an upper year course. And for this reason, we'll still transfer it. We're just going to give it the UNS or the unspecified code. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of how the courses are transferring. Um, and of course, it's your responsibility to discuss your degree plan requirements with your undergraduate chair. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk to you a little in a little bit about the tools that we've developed to help you with this academic planning. So you'll figure out exactly how you can talk to your undergraduate chair, who your undergraduate chair might be. And the reason we're encouraging you to talk to your undergraduate chair is because we can tell you that a course can transfer as specified or unspecified, but we can't tell you how either of those types of course transfers would count towards your degree plan requirements. Only your undergraduate chairs and or transfer credit uh, advisors can assist you with that academic planning. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the following slides. Uh, so let's use some of the tools that I mentioned as a way to dig into that a little bit more. So I've been referencing this tool called Academic Parameters of Exchange. Well, what is this? This is a simple PDF document that will reach you, as mentioned, in about two to three weeks. And this document outlines quite literally the academic parameters of your exchange. It will tell you the host university course load, that magic number I've mentioned that you need to enroll in if you want to transfer 15 units back to Queens. It will tell you the minimum grade at your host university that you need to earn in order to transfer back your credit. Another quick question for the chat. Boy, do I miss being in a lecture hall. Um, did anyone hear the, uh, the rumor that exchange is past fail? You can say yes or no in the chat if you're wanting to. So I'm seeing a yes. Yes. No. Okay, so a, a bit of a mix of responses here. Thanks folks for participating. So I hear very often from students that they believe exchange is pass fail. And while there is a, a minimum requirement for great transfer, uh, or sorry, for credit transfer, uh, it's not at that pass fail mark. So to me, it's not pass fail. Instead, as I mentioned earlier on, students need to earn the Queen's equivalent of a C at their host university, on their host university grade scale in order to transfer credit. Along with these important details, the academic parameters of exchange document might also specify some particular things about your host university. For instance, uh, with the University College Maastricht academic parameters of exchange documents, we will uh, have some particular details about their problem uh, or sorry project period uh, which students often have questions about. So if there's a history of, of particular questions around something with the pedagogy or the academic structure at your host university, this is where we're going to include that information so that you're fully uh, informed and, and aware. 
Now you'll see I've got in Burgundy a couple of examples here I thought we could use to kind of contextualize some of what I'm telling you. These come from uh, the Korea University academic parameters of exchange documents. Anyone here headed to Korea on exchange? Ah, there is someone here, wonderful. Well, lucky you, you get to be the example today. So when students go to Korea University, they have to enroll in 15 credits at Korea University. So you would go, you would sign up for your courses following their process, and you would need to make sure that you're counting as you're adding your courses to get to that magical number of 15. And when you are working hard and diligently on your courses and your assignments, your exams, you're aiming to have that minimum grade requirement equivalent to a Queen's C. At Korea University, that's either 63% or a D plus. Again, regardless of where you're going, you're going to find out what that uh, minimum grade requirement is for you. And off the top of my head, I don't think there's anything specific that we inform students about on the academic parameters of exchange document for Korea University. But I have here is the example that uh, we will tell you that you need to complete your exams at the host university. Spoiler, everyone gets this line on their academic parameters of exchange document. Um, and there may be some additional details, as I mentioned. So hopefully this document is going to help you as you approach your uh, host university application and as you get into that course registration process. Now we've got a few notes here on the screen that are specific to academic planning and I think they might address some of the questions or concerns you have. Firstly, transfer credit advisors within the Faculty of Arts and Science are the people who will determine how credit is transferred and they can also advise students on how transferred credit can Com like help complete uh, particular degree plan requirements. So transfer credit advisors are typically your undergraduate chair, but not always. There are some uh, departments like the Department of History that actually has another professor assigned to that role. Regardless, they are the people within the Faculty of Arts and Science that you'll be asking to assess your transfer credit. So assess the courses at your host uni for transfer credit. And they are also folks that you should be directing any questions about your degree plan requirements towards. Now, transfer credits may count towards the completion of your overall degree requirements, but not necessarily the completion of particular plan requirements. And again, that differentiation, the particular progression questions that you might have are best addressed by your transfer credit advisors. And I promise I'm going to tell you who they are in a few slides. Along with the uh, academic parameters of exchange document, we have a second tool that we are going to encourage you to use throughout your planning process. This tool will be used before, during, and after your exchange. It's the transfer credit package. So your transfer credit package will guide you through the transfer credit planning process. It contains an overall timeline. So as you'll note on the screen, it will tell you what you should be doing before exchange, potentially during your exchange, and definitely after your exchange. It has a frequently asked questions section to answer any questions you may have. It has a transfer credit advisory directory, or advisor directory, so we're going to tell you for each of the arts and science departments who you should direct your transfer credit questions to. And then it has two forms that you will use depending on where you are in the timeline. So you are going to be receiving this by the end of September. I think, Nikki, if I'm correct, we're going to be sending that out tomorrow, if that's the case. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful news. Tomorrow or, or possibly later this week, but you'll definitely be getting it soon. So you're going to use your transfer credit package to determine who your transfer credit advisor is. Sometimes students uh, will ask me, should I, if I'm a, a history student, should I send all of my courses for assessment to the history transfer credit advisor? And I'll often ask them, well, are you taking only history courses or are you taking some electives from other subject areas? If they're only taking history courses, then they should only need to be in touch with the subject matter expert in history, which is the history transfer credit advisor. But if they're taking some electives, let's say a drama course or a geography course, then they're actually going to need to speak to a few different transfer credit advisors. The golden rule with navigating that transfer credit advisor directory is to remember to gravitate towards the transfer credit advisors who are experts in the subject area of the courses you want to take. 
we wouldn't expect uh, necessarily the transfer credit advisor for history to be an expert in geography or drama. So that's a helpful way to kind of, kind of sort through that, uh, that part of the transfer credit package. When you contact the advisor, and again, this could be before exchange, during exchange or after exchange, we want you to tell them who you are. Pro tip, please include your student number. It helps faculty and staff at the university find out who you are and give you better service much quicker. Um, also tell them where you're going and for how long you'll be abroad. So I know someone here is headed to Korea University, which is super exciting. So you could say, hi, my name is Haley, my student number is this. I'm headed to Korea University on exchange and I'll be abroad for the winter 2022 term. And then you should ask them to review your academic plan for exchange. So that could include sending along some courses for assessment. And then if you have any, asking questions about how said courses might transfer back into your plan requirements. A hint we have is that you should download any course syllabi from your host university website for the courses you're interested in and that you think work well with your degree plan. Keep a record also of what you're told by your transfer credit advisor. And we're going to give you forms that make that process super easy. Of course, you could also look on our website because as some of you know, hopefully most of you, we have transfer credit reports for host universities listed on our website under the uh, column course load. Uh, so when you go onto our Find a University webpage and you see all of the partner profiles, you'll see a column to the right that says course load. And usually when you, when you follow along and find your host university's course load, you'll note it's hyperlinked. You can click that hyperlink and you can see a record of courses that students have previously transferred from your host university. The most important caveat with those transfer credit reports is that they are not guarantees that courses will continue to trans uh, transfer in any way that they are presented as on the um, on the report. Uh, courses will always need to be reassessed. It does give you kind of an idea though of how courses have transferred back previously and could help you with figuring out what courses are of interest and help you figuring out how you want to approach your transfer credit advisor. So a useful tool regardless. So what are these forms that I'm talking about that you can actually start to use and are, are actionable? within your package. The first is the pre-exchange transfer credit form. This is a form that is used for core and option uh, plan courses, not necessarily your electives. So you don't necessarily have to have your electives assessed before you go on exchange, unless you have a sneaking suspicion that there could be an issue with transferring them. And I'm going to in a minute show you what, uh, what, what some questions you may need to ask yourself about electives are. But primarily, before you go on exchange, your focus is getting any core or option plan courses assessed. For obvious reasons, these are, you know, if you think these are going to count towards core or option plan courses, it's really important that you have them assessed before you sign up and that you have a conversation with your transfer credit advisor so that you know you're actually on the right track. Because as I mentioned, it's only the transfer credit advisors who can determine how courses transfer back. So when do you use this? Ideally before exchange. I say ideally because I know that some of our partner universities may not have accessible syllabi until you actually arrive on campus. So as you're navigating the next couple of months with your host university, more information on that to come shortly, um, start to see when you're going to have access to the syllabi. Sometimes they're posted on your host university's website. You could go on tonight, find them, and start working on this. Sometimes, as mentioned, you may not have them until you arrive. If you're in the latter situation, my guidance for you is to contact your transfer credit advisor before you depart just to say, hi, um, my name's Haley. I'm going on exchange in winter 2022 to Sciences Po, we'll say. Um, and I know that I can't access my course syllabi until I actually arrive on campus. So I just wanted to send you a note in advance to let you know I'll be in touch with you at this time. That A, informs your transfer credit advisor of who you are, and B, gives them the heads up that you might be in touch with them in the coming months. So if you can have the courses assessed with the pre-exchange transfer credit form before you board your plane and head off, uh, then ideally you will do that during your ad drop period at your host university. And that's when you should contact your transfer credit advisor using the pre-exchange transfer credit form. So how do you do this? 
uh, well, we're going to send you the, the transfer credit form. It's PDF fillable, so you don't need to print or scan this. You can complete it on your computer. Then you'll email the relevant department's transfer credit advisor. So use that package, figure out who is the subject matter expert for the course I want to take. Um, you will send the form that's completed along with the syllabus or syllabi to the transfer credit advisor via email and you'll ask for an assessment. Then the transfer credit advisor will email you back. They'll either complete the form, filling in the uh, table to the right on the form, telling you how they think it will transfer back, or they will respond via email. A lot of the transfer credit advisors are doing that. That's completely okay as long as we see that it's from their email address, we know it's official. Um, they'll email that back to you and you will have that record of how the course will transfer. So hopefully that will bring you some calm and some assurances as you head into your exchange. Then you'll send an email of, uh, sorry, an email copy of your form to the International Programs Office. And of course, keep a copy for yourself. Your transfer credit advisor might keep a copy also. So I mentioned that I was going to give you a couple of tips for those tricky elective courses, because I mentioned the emphasis really is on the core and option plan courses being assessed before exchange. You don't necessarily have to have your electives assessed. When considering enrollment in any course at your host university, that we want you to think about these three things. One, you should not be enrolling in courses that can't be assessed by an advisor at Queens, and particularly in the Faculty of Arts and Science. So for instance, if your host university has got a dentistry course that's available to you as an exchange student, that's super cool, A, but B, it's not something that you should be enrolling in. We don't have a dentistry school or even department here at Queens. There's no one who could assess that course and it would not transfer back. We also want you to think for your electives, but also a potential core plan courses um, that you don't wanna be taking any practical courses. So for instance, candle making or jewelry appreciation, um, those are courses that also sound really interesting, but would not transfer back. They're not at the academic level that we need them to be at. So avoid those types of courses too. I wanna to make a particular note here about courses that are um, focused on sports. Many of our partners do have courses that have titles like soccer, basketball. Those courses would fall into that practical category and are not courses that you should be enrolling in. And then we say also that you should not be enrolling in courses that are similar to the ones you've already completed at Queens. Just like if you were here at Queens, we would not be allowing you to enroll in a course you've already completed. So that wouldn't fly also with exchange. So we talked a bit about the pre-exchange transfer credit form and we have a post-exchange transfer credit form. That is the second uh, practical component of your transfer credit package. So what is this form? What do we use this form for? We use this form for any core or option plan courses that you completed at your host university. If your course is changed, sorry for the typo on the screen, that should be changed during exchange. So if you arrived and then you were told, no, sorry, this professor is no longer offering the course, you need to make a change and you didn't have time to have it assessed, then you would use your post exchange transfer credit form for that course. Um, it's the same thing kind of applies with the syllabi example I was giving. So if you aren't able to, to access the syllabi, which of course the transfer credit advisor needs to do the assessment, uh, if you're not able to, to receive that in a timely manner and get that assessment with the pre-exchange transfer credit form, then you can of course complete that afterwards. Um, but ideally we are trying to get those core courses assessed before exchange. And you're also using the post exchange transfer credit form for electives. Primarily, that's what students are using the pre or post exchange transfer credit form for, because those are less of the priority to have assessed before you depart. When are you using this? As the name indicates, you are using this after your exchange. How are you using this? In very similar fashion, you are completing the PDF fillable form on your computer. You are emailing the relevant departments with the transfer credit form and the syllabi or syllabus, um, and you're asking them for assessment. As I've mentioned, you're sending this to the subject matter expert, so we're not sending drama courses to the history transfer credit advisor, we're going to send them to the drama transfer credit advisor. The transfer credit advisor will conduct their assessment. Sometimes they do it the same day. Sometimes it takes a week or so, it depends on what's going on with that transfer credit advisor's workflow, and then they'll send that on back to you. Once you receive the assessment, whether it's the completed form or if it's in an email from the um, official, uh, official email address of the transfer credit advisor, you're going to forward that on to the International Programs Office. In order for us to 
to finalize the transfer of your credits, we need to have completed assessments, either using the pre or post exchange transfer credit form for all of your courses. And we also need to have your host university transcript. Now your host university transcript is usually something that is sent directly to our team from your host university. There's a few instances, uh, particularly in Australia, a little bit in the UK now, where host universities will securely release the, um, the transcript to you, um, and then you will need to forward that on to our team. But you will receive instructions either from your host university or from our team at the end of your exchange, so that's not anything you need to worry about now. The focus right now is the transfer credit assessments. And that wraps up the tools that we're going to be using for the transfer credit assessments. I've repeated the text box that I had in the last slide because I think it's so important to emphasize this. So again, you should not be enrolling in courses that cannot be assessed by an advisor at Queen's. You should not be enrolling in practical courses and you should not be enrolling in courses that are very similar to ones you've completed at your uh, here at Queen's. If you have any questions about this at all, even last week we had a question about this, please send them to our team. If we can't answer it in-house, we will send that out to the relevant transfer credit advisor for some assistance. We would much, much rather you ask the question early so we can give you some guidance while you can still make course changes rather than asking it at the end of your exchange. Now I wanna move on to some general guidance around academic planning and your transfer credits. And this is where I want to talk a bit about some of those academic differences that, uh, that we see on exchange. So I'll try to include some examples here to contextualize what I'm talking about. Um, but I think I wanna start off just by saying that you know, you, you've signed on for an experience uh, where things are going to be different. So you're not studying at Queen's in winter 2022. You are going to be in a new place with new academic etiquette, if you will. So depending on where you're going, there might be different ways to address your professors. Um, there will definitely be different grading systems, different academic expectations. We're gonna talk a little bit about that here, um, but I wanna encourage you to remember that change doesn't come around without any kind of adoption that's needed, whether it's slight or if it's a little bit bigger. Um, a lot can be learned from those periods of adoption. And there's sometimes a lot of joy and happiness in them when you kind of stumble upon something that's different. But sometimes they can be challenging too. So if you are abroad and remembering this session, I just want to remind you that uh, it's normal to have a little bit of culture shock, a little bit of um, maybe missing home, homesickness, while you adjust to some of this difference. Um, but we're going to put you in touch with some students later this week who will tell you about their own experiences, and then they're going to tell you about all of the many wonderful things that happen um, before, during, and after those periods of adjustment. So keep those things in mind. Lots of great stories to come. Um, and remember to have some grace and patience with yourself as you are starting to experiences, experience these academic differences. Also remember, if you're thinking about applying to graduate school, that having experience already with academic difference can be a really great way to stand out from the crowd. I definitely use that to my advantage when I apply to grad school. <laughs> so now let's get into talking about some academic difference. Um, grades on exchange is where I want to start. So your grades count. They are very important. As I've mentioned a few times tonight, the minimum grade that's required to transfer credit to Queens is the equivalent of a Queens C. That is on your host university uh, grading scale. And the academic parameters of exchange document is gonna tell you exactly what that is. As I was, part of me saying with my own experience graduate, um, but also medical and law schools, they're likely gonna wanna see your grades from exchange. So when I was a student, I, I worked really hard, I worked multiple jobs, and I was fortunate enough to study abroad uh, three times. And when I applied to graduate schools, I hustled and I got four host uni, well, four, four undergrad transcripts from, I think, three different continents, um, which was really exciting. And I felt kind of like I was bragging, but I got to submit them all to these graduate programs I applied for. They all had uh, grading legends or, um, Kind of schemes on the back so I could rest assured that these admissions officers knew how to assess them they were given the instructions and I got to prove that not only was I a great student here in Canada but I was also a great student in these other places I had traveled to so it's likely going to be the case if you are thinking about graduate medical or law school that you would be submitting your Queen's transcript along with your host university transcript and grading legend 
Um, and this is another reason why grades are so important on exchange. Now, the next point is super important. This is a question that we get from students all the way from, you know, the Queen's uh, open house days where we talk to prospective students and to, to now when students are on the exchange program. Your cumulative GPA from your host university does not factor into your Queen's records at all. So we will receive transfer credit, you will receive transfer credit, pardon me, from exchange on your Queen's transcript, but not the grades. And that means that your cumulative GPA at Queen's, when you end the fall 2021 term, will remain the same even after we've added your transfer credits until you begin your fall 2022 term. This is another reason why it's so important to send your host university transcripts on with your graduate medical and law school application so that you can demonstrate not only that you've received the credit, but also demonstrate what your grades were. Now, though we're not transferring grades from your host university, we are transferring credit. So long, again, as you complete that magical course load number and you earn the Queen's equivalent of a C. This means that with careful academic planning, you are continuing to progress through your degree plan. And those conversations that you'll have with your transfer credit advisor are going to inform how you'll plan your courses, of course. And with uh, that kind of cooperation with your transfer credit advisor, you'll be able to determine how your exchange courses are fitting into your degree plan requirements or degree requirements. So to sum up, we're not transferring your grades uh, and we never do on, on the exchange program, but we are transferring back your credit. And with careful academic planning, you'll be able to pro progress through your degree plan. Um, finally, every school uses a different grading system. So I studied abroad in Scotland when I was an undergraduate student. And I remember getting my first assessment back. It was a paper in history. I was a politics student. I was a bit nervous about it because I was like, did I use the right style? Did I cite? properly um, and I was really disappointed with my grade like very disappointed it was about 10 percent lower than it normally is and I had to go to my professor's office hours to pick up the grade I remember dreading it waiting in the hall with my peers and as students do they were talking we were talking about you know what did you get what did you get and I remember sharing with a few people what my grade was and people were like wow you did really well it must be one of the top grades you should be so proud like what is happening i was so confused and i had a conversation with the professor and they reminded me that i was on a different grading scale i was not used to scoring that low but that's because at my host university the passing grade was not 50 percent; it was 40 percent. so i actually was kind of scoring on par with where i normally do we typically get frantic emails sometimes phone calls eh, maybe one to three times a year from students who are really nervous about this um and Usually it's just a gentle reminder that it's a different grading scale and we can kind of help them see how that grade would transfer if it was on the Queen's uh, system, what, what that kind of comparison looks like. And then folks remember, oh, right, okay. And then there's often a moment of, of kind of reassurance and relief. Um, so do remember this when you're abroad. If you get your first paper back, if you've got a midterm exam and you feel like you didn't ace it, you didn't do as well as you normally do, remember that you are on that different grading system. Be kind to yourself and if in doubt, connect with the exchange office at your host uni or here at Queen's and we're happy to help give you a little bit of context into what that grade actually means. Along with different grains, there's different education systems, of course, around the world. Um, and as I mentioned, you've signed on for a different experience. So let's uh, embrace that, let's watch for that, and let's learn from that. Some examples could be that your contact hours with your professors may be a little bit less. You might be required to do some more self-guided learning. Apologies in advance, some of my examples might be quite, quite um, UK-centric because that was uh, a really formative exchange experience of mine. But when I also was studying in Scotland, I went from having about 15 hours of contact with my profs here in Canada as a politics student on a weekly basis to about nine hours um, when I was in, in Glasgow. And that was lovely. I really enjoyed it. And then I got to the end of my uh, my term and I had some very heavily weighted final exams because I wasn't having very much contact hours, wasn't having very much assignments throughout, and I felt a little bit of pressure. Um, but when I think back on that experience, I think I really learned a lot about time management, um, and again, adapting to difference. And I think those lessons have served me well. So prepare for potentially a little more independent learning.
potentially um, contact hours that are quite similar to Queen's, you're going to learn more about what your host university experience is like as you start to engage with the application process. Of course, the best advice we can say is give yourself some time to settle in academically. Things may not come as fast as you want them to, um, but you are adapting to difference. And that takes a little bit of time. And like I said, a little bit of grace. So I gave you a, a pretty scary example from my life anyway, scary in my life, of the grading system and how that can be a little bit different and a little bit um, frightening at first and then really cool to, to think back on as you kind of progress through. Um, and of course, along with having less contact hours or face time with your professors, you may also have less access to um, office hours, let's say, for staff people at your host university. So here in North America, we, we are very much operating on kind of an um, excellent kind of customer service model. Um, you know, we want to be as accessible as possible, which means we want to have open doors, we want to have Zoom rooms and the like. Um, there are places in the world where that's absolutely not the administrative culture, and that could also require a little bit of adaptation. So if you're experiencing that, remember that, you know, there are different administrative and academic cultures and give yourself a little bit of time to adjust. Exams on exchange are another example of academic difference. So just to note here, you must write all of your exams at your host university. If you depart early, then you're going to assume any risk associated with that decision because Queens will not be proctoring exchange on behalf of our exchange partners. And on the bottom bullet there, you'll see another couple of examples of um, how exams could be different. So uh, one exam could be worth 80 to 100% of your final grade. I had that experience uh, at two different exchanges. Lots of students tell us quite often that that's their experience. That could mean that you don't actually have a lot of courses during your semester and that everything is sitting in that final assessment at the end. And that can sound scary because it, it's quite different. But again, just reflecting on my own experience, I think that's also an opportunity to develop some new academic skills, to try something different. And just because it's not what we're used to doesn't mean it's not um, a situation that you might flourish in as well. Um, exams could be oral. They might be oral and in front of other folks. So we sent a student a few years ago to Aarhus University in Denmark, and they came back and told us that they all of their final exams were oral or verbal, so they were speaking their answers to their professor and in front of their classmates. And that's quite different from anything that I've heard here at Queen's. Um, and your exams could be large papers or projects, and maybe that's quite similar to some classes that you've had here at Queen's. So it's really going to vary, but again, I would like to position this as a great learning opportunity. And perhaps another way to um, just uh, emphasize your academic abilities when you do move on to your next academic journey in grad school, medical school, or law school. Now I see that we're kind of running short on the time here, so I'm not going to get too into details on these academic regulations, but we'd like to point these out for you. There's two academic regulations held by the Faculty of Arts and Science that we want you to keep in mind while you're participating on the program. The first is Regulation 3.7, and that's registration in courses offered by other faculties at schools. To clarify, we're talking about schools at Queen's, like the Smith School of Business. We're not talking about your host university here. And so it says a maximum of six units from courses offered by other faculties or schools may be counted towards the program and or plan requirements of a degree within arts and science. I would categorize this as your degree plan progression planning. So this is something if you're kind of nervous about, maybe you have taken courses in other faculties or schools, you're not sure how that impacts your transfer credit planning. That's a great question and conversation for your transfer credit advisor. So I would always encourage you to err on the side of caution, have those conversations before you depart. The other regulation is regulation 12.3, students on international exchange programs, and this connects to the honors list. Um, this is not something that the international programs office advises on. So at this session, we like to put a spotlight on that and then direct any kinds of questions that you might have about this over to the Faculty of Arts and Science. So I'm not sure if they're hosting any kind of in-person services right now. The best way to get in touch would be after you read the regulation on their academic calendar to reach out and contact one of their advisors. Now I wanna wrap up by talking about um, what you should do if you are experiencing some difficulties with your academic transition. And again, you'll continue to hear from our team throughout the program. We'll 
continue to send you some lovely uh, emails and, and tips and, and remind you that we're always available, even if you're abroad, for some uh, virtual conversations. But really, our goal is to prepare you with helpful advice so that you can make informed decisions regardless of your circumstances. If things aren't going well, whether it's academic or personal, we, we genuinely do want to know. We, this whole team really cares very deeply about your exchange experience and we want to be here to support you. So if you, um, before you go abroad, while you're abroad, or maybe upon re-entry, if you're finding that you're struggling with some adjustment, if you're feeling overwhelmed or confused and unsure of where to go, you can contact Nikki, myself, any member of our team, and we're going to do everything that we can to help kind of set things straight or kind of give you some guidance based on our experience and our knowledge. Know that Queen's will always respond when you ask for help. So please let us know if things don't feel right. Also, we have a network of individuals that we work with at your host universities who are available to help. Every day we receive emails from Coach University, from Bill Kent, from the University of Warwick and the University of Hong Kong. So we're quite familiar with folks there. And if you are abroad and just feeling like things aren't right, know that we can always put you in touch with someone who's actually on the ground with you who can help out. So what next? That was a lot of information. What are you supposed to do with it? All right, well, I've got a checklist for you. I don't know about you all, but I'm a big fan of checklists. So let's walk through this together and then we can tackle some of your questions. We are conducting academic and financial checks to ensure continued eligibility for exchange. So a few folks have reached out to me and said, I'm a bit worried last year was hard or I took some really difficult summer courses. Um, I'm worried if I'm gonna be eligible or not to continue on the program. Know that we will check that uh, in advance of nominating you and we'll actually reach out to you if we have any concerns. Of course, our goal is always to send students abroad. So we'll reach out and we'll have a conversation and we'll go from there. Uh, tomorrow or potentially later this week, you're going to receive the orientation recording along with the transfer credit package. As I mentioned in the last or in the next two to three weeks, you will receive the academic parameters of exchange document that is specific to your host university. I apparently forgot to update our slides with our new safety abroad session date, my apologies, but the safety abroad session will be held on October 6th. This will be um, facilitated by Sandra Jeffers, who's the health and safety specialist in the Department of Environmental Health and Safety. And it's going to talk all about OCASP, which is your off-campus activity safety policy. That's a mandatory part of your pre-departure preparations. And of course, we're hosting Exchange Connect. I have to smile because it's my favorite part of pre-departure. That's going to be held on September 23rd. I believe we're including a link in our follow-up from this session to register potentially. So um, you'll have an opportunity if you haven't already registered, but we've sent a few emails now. So take a look in the Exchange folder on your inbox. Um, if you don't have an Exchange folder, I recommend you create an Exchange folder and keep all the information in one place. That tends to be helpful for lots of folks. Um, and do try and come out to Exchange Connect because it's a really great way to meet other students. Soon, if you haven't already, you will receive your application prompt. This is going to give you the instructions that you need to complete your Exchange application. For most partners, it will take about one to two weeks to complete an application. Application requirements typically include your home or your Queen's transcript, um, potentially an academic reference, um, potentially a list of courses, usually a passport scan. So they really vary from partner to partner, but you will get an email that lists specifically what you need to get. And it's gonna give you some tips on how to get those supporting docs. And then of course, you will complete your application by your host university's deadline. Once you complete your application, that's really when you're going to start working closely with your host university. I know many students have questions about um, applying for housing, applying for study permits. Those aren't things that Queens can advise you on because they are specific to your host university and host country experience. So once you complete your host university application and you get your acceptance, that's when you're going to start to get that information and be able to work on those pre-departure tasks. Throughout this process, adhere to the financial guidance, um, particularly around your acceptance letter. So we say in our documents, do not make any substantial exchange purchases until you receive your acceptance letter from your host university. Um, then you'll receive your host university and as mentioned, begin working directly with them. 
Of course, throughout as well, you'll work on your transfer credit planning with your departments or the transfer credit advisors. So it's also tricky to try and stick a date on when your transfer credit planning should begin, because for some students that will be during the exchange application, others it will be after but before departure, and others it will be actually upon arrival at the host university. So you need to follow your lead, the lead of your host university on when the course registration starts. And once course registration starts, that's when you'll need to start working on your transfer credit planning. Complete OCAS by October 30th, that is one date that we can give you. And that more information will come on that on the October 6th session. And drop your winter 2022 Queen's courses by October or November. So we're currently working with the registrar's office to set a date for that. And you will receive lots of notice as to when you should drop those winter courses. Uh, for some context, the winter 20, 2022 courses refers to the opportunity Queen's provided this year for exchange students to enroll in Queen's courses during their exchange term as an academic backup, just in case the, the pandemic interrupts exchange. Um, so by October, November, we're expecting most students to be nominated. This is the time when we will say, now you can drop your Queen's courses. And then in their place, we will add something called your exchange segment, which will generate your tuition for exchange. So this process is quite new, still underway, and we will give you a specific date once that's been set. That was a lot of information for an hour. I'm really happy that we're recording it so you can continue to refer back. I know that you probably have some questions. So at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Nikki to kindly stop recording the session.